So there's some very traditional things that Spanish builders do. This is kind of quirky, this side inlay. Now that's tricky business. A little volute there, right? You can take the headstock off if you wanted to. But the one thing that the Spanish builders do that CF didn't, because CF, with his cabinet making background, uses a dovetail joint to attach the body to the neck. It's a really convenient way to build a guitar because it isn't until the end of the process that you're attaching the body to the neck. Spanish builders traditionally took a different view and uh, they could talk to you about why they think it's better. There's more than one right way to build a good guitar and so that's always a fascinating discussion at the guitar builders conferences. Whose idea is better? It's like, well, they might all be good ideas. The Spanish builder, actually the neck billet and the body block are one piece and they cut a couple of slots down at the bottom, bend the sides and then insert them into the slots and attach the sides at the bottom block. And from that point on, they're working with something this big. It's awkward. And so if you look in this guitar, which is an early example of CF copying, copying, I'll admit it, we do it all the time. He said, I'm gonna use dovetail. It's what I'm used to, I'm comfortable, it works. But he made it look, if you go inside, he made it look like it has a Spanish foot. I mean, he really knocked it off, and it worked. And you know why it worked? Because the guitars were good, and they were built where they were gonna live. The guitar already knew about the climate of Eastern Pennsylvania, which is not this, that dissimilar from New York, or, or New England, or Baltimore. And so people said, wow. And I've gotta tell you, Martin guitars were never cheap, but people said they're good value good value. And that's really what our reputation is all about. You get good value in the Martin guitar. The other question that the scholars tried to, to answer is where did this X-Brace thing come from? Where did it come from? Why? Who did that? Why did he do that? What they did is they took the old Martins in this room, big long tables, our collection, their collection, they laid them out chronologically, and they went inside using a mirror and took photographs of the top inlay and its evolution. And what you'll see over time, not overnight, it wasn't one of those things where he went to bed and said, ah, I have a dream, X-bracing, do it tomorrow. Over time, X-bracing became a thing. Why? Well, we don't know. However, what we do know is that when you make a very traditional Spanish guitar, you tie the strings onto the bridge, or maybe you have ball ends, right? However, at the same time, CF was also making what are known as pin bridge guitars. And in that case, after you glue the bridge onto the top, you drill holes through the top to accommodate the pins that hold the string in place. And when CF used the very traditional Spanish fan bracing, which is still used today, they came to the conclusion that it was quite possible that right at the end, when CF went to go drill the holes in the bridge, because when he went to align the bridge, he had to move it a little bit, he might have ended up drilling through one of those fan braces. Well, that's a no-no. And now what do you do? You tear the top off and start over. Well, you don't want to do that when you're building a guitar, particularly when you're that far along. And so he began to move the fans out of the way, gradually, over time. And eventually, he must have come to the conclusion, it's like, well, I've moved these things this far, and I need some support up here, Instead of having these little braces down below the sound ball, why don't I make a longer brace and crisscross it, have it crisscross right there. Well, we need some support because there's a big hole. And it worked. We believe this is the first X-braced guitar. Not just X-braced Martin guitar, X-braced guitar ever made. So by this point, he had figured it out. This is gonna work for me and my brand and my style and my sound. A famous European musician came to America on a tour and she became aware of CF's reputation as a fine guitar builder and commissioned a guitar from him. And he must have thought, this is the opportunity for me to really get this x brace right for Madame Degoni. Nope, she was not that kind of Madame. She was a famous solo musician, toured across America, with her brand new X-braced Martin guitar. What we found, however, was no matter how well it worked for gut strings, when we transitioned to steel strings, it really worked. So here are some more examples of CF's early work. 
working now, you know, as, like I said, with partners and his son. Son's joining the business, CF Jr. is learning how to build guitars in the style of his father. By now, we've kind of that rectangular headstock, something we'll, we continue to use today. Starting to see, particularly in these, some of the more modern, you know, small bodied shapes. They're all 12 fret. That's, that's how you built a Spanish guitar. They were all 12 fret. Um, some exotic materials, with ivory, uh, of course, Brazilian rosewood, Goncalo Alves. So we still use Goncalo Alves today. Isn't that cool? We would try other stuff. The zither was popular. The zither was really popular. And so we made some. The coolest thing about this display is my grandfather. I remember my grandfather saying, do you know what this, the purpose of this table is? I said, well, I don't know, I could put a zither on it. He goes, yeah, there's more to it than that. So this table's made of spruce. Here's the little ivory balls down here, right, with a little teeny pin. So the pin would secure your zither on whatever playing surface you were playing it on. If we took this away and put the zither on the spruce, spruce table, the spruce table acted like an amplifier. How cool is that? Chris Martin here at the old factory in 1890. No, no, actually, no, I'm still in the museum. This is the display that, that gives you a feel for what was going on over at North Street, which is where we built guitars after we moved downtown until we moved out to this facility in 1964. Thank you, Folk Boom. So by now, okay, now CF has joined, Junior has joined the business, father and son. CF was a pretty much of a steady end. Um, carried on his father's designs, kept the quality up, increased the volume, which is always a challenge when you're making a high quality product. Um, but he doesn't get a, a, a tremendous amount of uh, acknowledgement. And that happens. You know, when you, when you study family businesses, um, oftentimes the mantra of the second generation is, don't screw it up. Mom or dad started something cool in the garage or in the basement or in the kitchen, started a business, don't screw it up. And he did not. There were daughters. There were numerous daughters over the generations. They all married, and they went, they went off with their husbands. None of them stayed. None of the, the, the son-in-laws joined the business. Um, up through me, it was the firstborn male son. That's, you know, sometimes that's the way things happen. Now, I do have a daughter, so we'll see how that goes, right? But, uh, yeah, so this is what it would have looked like over at North Street. It evolved over time. The, the, the building grew as the business got uh, more successful. We added when we could uh, tooling, fixturing. We've always embraced tooling and fixturing. If you're going to make more than one guitar, you got to tool up. There's no no doubt about it. And if you're going to tool up, why not make more than one guitar, right? And so that's a discussion we always have when we're coming out with a new model: is how many do we think we're going to sell relative to how much it's going to cost to tool up to make that new model? We're very fortunate that some of the tooling and fixturing, other than renewing it because it wears out. I mean, you know, the dreadnought's the dreadnought. It, it's, there, there has never been a reason to change the Martin dreadnought. If you go on the website, I wrote a little article uh, that was published in Music Trades, and it's also on our website. And it, it was me just talking to the industry about the pandemic and, pandemic and COVID-19 relative to our history. And certainly the company has experienced a lot of ups and downs. In the 1800s, there were significant economic booms and busts. I mean significant. And there wasn't a lot of safety net back then. Uh, that's why some of the programs that came out of Washington came out of Washington, because there wasn't a safety net. And people, hey, things were great, but things were great. But when they weren't, things were really tough. And let's throw into that a civil war, OK? 100 miles from here, Americans are killing Americans. And we're still debating this today. We're still debating the Civil War today, so that's another topic for another time. But that's the kind of stuff that you know CF Senior and CF Junior had to deal with. When business was good, it was good, and when it wasn't, it wasn't. And a small company like ours, all you can do sometimes is hang on for dear life and hope you survive. And we have, and we're very fortunate. And I want to thank all of you for your continued support of the Martin Brand.